Uh, good evening, everyone. This is a historic evening for many reasons. First, it's our, our first return to an in-person event in over 20 months. So that's, that's an event in itself. And it's really great to see many of you here in real life. And uh, a big hello to the hundreds of people that are watching online and those that are upstairs in the Sky Room as well for this special visionary program. Our Stuart Regan Visionary Series is one of the most anticipated events at the New Museum and in the city. And we're most grateful to Barbara Gladstone for so generously sponsoring this series that's now in its 13th year. Thank you. The series, which is dedicated to imagining a better future, is a tribute to the memory of Stuart Regan and all that he stood for. Uh, we featured so many exceptional creative thinkers and doers from the broad arena of contemporary culture who are breaking new ground, from Bill T. Jones, who was our first speaker, to Alice Waters, to Hilton Alls and Maya Lynn, Jimmy Wales, Claudia Rankine and Rachel Kushner, just to name a few. And tonight, we're absolutely thrilled to honor and hear from two brilliant artists in conversation, playwright and actor Jeremy O'Harris. <laughs> and artist filmmaker Arthur Jaffa. <laughs> <laughs> His work, Love is the Message and the Message is Death, was featured as part of our exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America, last spring. We loved having you here for uh, many, many months. Both are true visionaries of our time, artists who are actively responding to times of change and compelling us to see the world in different ways. Their work is riveting and is transforming our culture in real time. So. Thank you for joining us. And I'm now going to turn it over to our Keith Herring, Director of Education and Public Engagement, Andrew Ann Westover, to introduce our speakers more fully. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Welcome again to the New Museum of Contemporary Art. We are thrilled to welcome you back in person and especially thrilled to welcome and honor our visionaries this year. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the Lenape people, elders and ancestors, past, present and future. Again, on behalf of the New Museum, we are thrilled to inaugurate this year's edition of the Stuart Regan Visionaries Series. This annual flagship program recognizes individuals who have made major contributions to art and culture and who are actively imagining a better future. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. In addition to thanking our director, Lisa, I'd also like to thank Massimilio, Massimiliano Gioni, Ed Listenis and Artistic Director, and Education and Public Engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, and the entire New Museum team who make this possible. The New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Bowery Council, digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller, and the Visionary Series is made possible by the Stuart Regan Visionaries Fund established by a gift from Barbara Gladstone in honor of her son, Stuart Regan. We also thank our members and supporters, like you, who help make these programs possible. I'll now share some very brief biographical notes about each of tonight's honorees. I know many of you in this room already know and love them, but for our hundreds who have gathered online, a bit of background. Jeremy O'Harris is a playwright, actor, producer, and philanthropist who currently resides in New York City. Harris is the creator of the Broadway play, Slave Play, which was nominated for a record 12 Tony Awards and won the 2018 Kennedy Center Rosa Parks Playwriting Award, the Lorraine Hansberry Playwriting Award, the Lotus Foundation Prize in the Arts and Sciences. Harris co-wrote A24's critically acclaimed film, Zola, with director Janica Bravo. He is currently adapting the sci-fi eptic, The New World by Alice Cott for Warner Brothers Pictures. Harris also has an overall deal with HBO and is a co-producer on the television series Euphoria. He is currently co-creating and co-showrunning an adaptation of Britt Bennett's best-selling novel, The Vanishing Half. 
As an actor, Harris recently appeared on HBO Max's Gossip Girl, reimagining and will next be seen in season two episodes of Netflix's Emily in Paris. <laughs> Harris's major philanthropic work began in 2020 when he pledged and redistributed significant portions of his earnings to the New York, sorry, the New York Theater Workshop, libraries across the United States, and microgrants to support emerging theatrical talent. His honors and awards include the Vineyard Theater's Paula Vogel Playwright Award, 2016 McDowell Colony Fellowship, Orchard Project Greenhouse Artist, Resident Playwright with Colt Coeur, and commissions from Lincoln Center Theater and the Public Theater. Harris holds an MFA in playwriting from Yale School of Drama. Arthur Jaffa is an artist, filmmaker, and cinematographer. Across three decades, Jaffa has developed a dynamic practice comprising films, artifacts, and happenings that reference and question the universal and specific articulations of black being. Jaffa's films have garnered acclaim at the Los Angeles, New York, and Black Star Film Festivals, and his artwork is represented in museum collections worldwide. Jaffa has recent and forthcoming solo exhibitions of his work at the Perez Art Museum Miami, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archives, Gallery Rodolfin, Moderna Museet in Stockholm, and the Louisiana Museum of Art in Denmark. In 2019, he received the Golden Lion for the best participant of the 58th Venice Biennale, May You Live in Interesting Times. Now, few quick notes before we begin. The program will last for approximately one hour. If time allows, we will have a Q&A at the end. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. We will be answering questions both from within the room and from our friends online. I encourage you to learn more about upcoming programs public programs on our website, newmuseum.org. And now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to our visionaries. Thank you. They asked me if I prepared questions, and I was like, no. No. <laughs> I wanted to just hang out with you like we did in your studio that one time. OK. Yeah. Um, how are you feeling? I, I feel all right. I'm a little tired. You know, like everybody, I think it's running. Exactly. Right. So you're um, probably the person I know who spends more time on a plane than me. Really? Yeah. I don't. I don't think I spend nearly as much time on a plane as you. No, I like the last time I talked to you, you were like, "Oh yeah, I have to go to like Stockholm, then I go to London, then I go to Paris, I'm back to New York, then I'm back in L.A." <laughs> I was like, "That's a lot." Yeah. It it probably sounds like more than it is actually, but uh, I mean, I think like a lot of people, um, you know, I had a backlog of places I had to go to and. Uh, when uh, the travel uh, restrictions sort of let up, all of a sudden I was sort of running uh, from one place to the other. Like the show that I had in, at uh, Louisiana Museum, we had installed it and it just had sat for like five, almost six months, just like installed, but you know, it wasn't open. So as soon as um, the travel restrictions let up, I just sort of went over very quickly. And then once I was there, you know, and I was trying to just do as much as possible before I came back. So. It sounds like more, <laughs> more than it was. I, I, I know I don't travel as much as you do, so <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't know, it's, it's funny, like uh, like a lot of people, I think uh, the first notice I took of you obviously was Slave Play, um, which I went and saw with a really good friend of mine, and it was a startling. And, uh, and then I heard afterwards, because I remember like uh, me and my friend, um, uh, a really good friend of mine. We were sitting there watching it, and we were laughing. We felt like we were sort of out of sync with the audience or something. <laughs> we would laugh at things that nobody else would laugh at, and then people would laugh, and we were just sitting there like two Iranian clerics or something, you know, just like. <laughs> uh, and then afterwards, and I was talking to somebody about it afterwards. They said, "Oh yeah, but Jeremy had these, he had these, uh, you know, shows that were like for black only audiences and stuff like that, which was." Uh, I mean, you know, intense to think of, like, in this day and time. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I I, um, I am always down to, like, uh, explore and uh, challenge myself in new ways and listen to my audience, you know? Um, that's one of the things I take on a lot. And every time I've done the production of the play, starting at Yale, there's been something that someone in the audience has said that's like stuck with me and been like, let me try that out. Let's see. I've never seen that before. So like when we first did the play at Yale, 
my director and Weinstein, who directed the very first workshop production of it, uh, their parent asked me like, hey, I love this play, but I feel like it's a lot to take on this play because the way you structured it, the catharsis happens in the last moment of the play. And I was like, oh, that's true. She's like, yeah, but this course happens after catharsis. Like, you can't just like let us out. She's like, I think you're demanding that we talk about it while we're in the space. She's like, so what if it ended with the talk back every night? And I was like, I'm not doing all that. Right. I was like, but what's a version of a talk back every night? And I was like, oh yeah, like what if there was someone that people could talk to if they wanted to? Because I also know that like I'm the kind of person that could see that and be like, great, I'm gonna go have dinner and talk about it. I don't wanna talk in a theater about it for that long. Right. So when I went to the York Theater Workshop, I was like, hey, my friend's mom gave me this idea and I think we have to do it where there can be someone that everyone can talk to after the play. So at New York Theater Workshop, after the play, there was like um, these like three docents sort of who you could go to and like they were like um, sort of, they would deal with anyone who was tra felt trauma from it or just like wanted to have like a friend to talk to because they showed up by themselves and were like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with all this. And that was great. Um, but then one of my friends, uh, the musician Kalela, she saw the play. And um, at New York Theater Workshop, and she came up to me and she was like, okay, so I've seen this play three times now, and I fucking love it. But I was watching myself laugh in that mirror in the very front row, and all of my black friends were with me, and all I saw was just like all these white demons behind me. And she was like, she was like, and I wish that I could see the play without like these sort of like um, maniacal, wealthy, like white people just sort of being, ka, 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 ka. Like, she's like, because I don't think they're laughing at the same thing I'm laughing at. And she was like, could you do it one time with just black people? And I was like, I don't know if that's allowed, but yeah, I don't exactly. see why not. <laughs> yeah, I was like, let's try it. So then we went on Broadway. Because like, again, she said this after the play had closed already. So when I found out the play was going to Broadway, I was like, oh, by the way, so not only do I want to be a producer, but I also want to make sure that there are at least like two productions that are just for black people. And everyone was like, what? Yeah. I was like, I don't know. I think it'll be cool to do that. And I didn't know what it was going to feel like. I didn't know what it was going to be. I, you know, had this complex relationship because I think that like you, um, uh, well, I think this is a, an experience that a lot of young black artists have or successful black artists have wherein like your success is very much like um, celebrated by the black community. But there's also like portions of the black internet that will always say you're not doing something right for someone else and the sometimes for me i don't know if it's the same is true with you the loudest voices are the people who say i'm doing it wrong mm -hmm. so especially with the sort of like heightened um lens of uh the capital that broadway brings a playwright i was feeling really guilty about the fact that there were so many white audiences and i was like do black people like my play i don't think they do yeah. maybe no black person likes it i'm just the only one um never mind the fact that my mom had seen it and plenty of black people had seen it before that but you know the internet's loud and so I was like, we're doing the thing. We're doing it with all black people. Let's see if we can, we can get them there. So the first blackout night we had, almost the entire theater was full. It was like 700 people um, in the theater. Uh, and it was the craziest experience I've ever had. Because it felt like for the first time theater um, coalesced with what um, my nostalgic idea, my nostalgic idea of theater is, which is that for me, as someone who grew up seeing my first theatrical experiences in a black American church in the South, um, where like, you know, the sort of Pentecostal fervor that like takes over an audience is what I always um, felt when I saw Shakespeare. Um, and that was the only other place I felt similar. Like I actually saw that church-like vibe inside of an actual theater on Broadway with 700 black people um, whooping and hollering and like, you know, engaging and like with the full freedom of their body, um, taking over the space and being like, uh, and rejecting the sort of like cultural norms of the theater, the many of which were literally invented by a Nazi. Um, when Wagner made the ring, ring cycle, just like Google it. But like, you know, people were like, you know, like talking back to the theater and be like, you better tell him, bitch, you know, or like whatever. And then like, you know, at one point, Kiki Palmer was like, I gotta go to the bathroom. And then she's like, got up, went to the bathroom, came back, which is like, it seems like such a small thing, but it was the way in which she did it, where she had her finger up like this, which was like a gesture that was reminiscent of like childhood and going to church, being like, I'm listening, I'm here, I'm present, but I'm just gonna exit for a second. Um, and I felt like that sense that I, I truly allowed a theater to feel a theater on Broadway to feel like a space completely owned by black, mm -hmm. by a black audience felt um, like revelatory, and it made me think about places like the Studio Museum and all of these other black museums that like uh, sit 
like, you know, uh, in tandem with the new museum or, you know, the Whitney, et cetera. And like artists are fed into both very seamlessly. Um, and I started mourning the fact that like, even though we have the National Black Theater and even though we have like, you know, the studio, the, uh, the studio theater in DC, there is not like a sustainable black, like, you know, um, there's not a sustainable black owned theater at all in, in America. Um, that's like at the level of like, um, of any of the major Broadway houses. Um, they don't have the same infrastructures. They don't have an audience size between 700 and 1500. And that just changes things. Mm -hmm. And it made me like, imagine and yearn and like point towards a future future where like that could be something. I think it's one of the reasons why the art world feels uh, a little farther ahead of us in sort of discourses around race and theater. But I, you're, you're, think so, really? I do, but I want to know what you think about that because I, I, I think that there's like, um, there's like, I think that the discourses feel at least more elevated. Like I feel like we feel um, because there, it hasn't, there's no stable, um, there's no stable institutions we can point to as like um, living, breathing black institutions that like keep the black canon alive and in conversation with like the very loud, large, like white contemporary canon. Um, a lot of people will say things that are just like truly psychotic. I'm like, wait, like you studied theater at like a major university and you were just saying like, I've never even heard of a black play that does like X, Y, or Z. And it's like, well, literally there's so many from literally like, the nineteen the like 1920s on that do exactly the thing you're talking about, but there's no like um uh sort of no, no museum things, right? So like I'm thinking about like the fact that like I, I feel like people uh like me who yearned for experimental black work forget that Melvin Van Peebles or don't know at all that Melvin Van Peebles had a musical on Broadway in nineteen seventy two that was nominated for a Tony over for Best New Musical over Jesus Christ Superstar called Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death, right? I think people don't realize that Intazaki Shange's play um wasn't a rarity in 1976, that actually in 1976 on Broadway there were like nine other shows by black people that same season. And I think that now they're like, look at this, we got eight black shows on Broadway this season. I'm like, that's not enough. Yeah. Like there's been moments where there have been more. And I think yeah. that the art world seems to remember that a little bit better, but maybe I'm wrong and I it's a grass is greener uh, thing. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. You know, honestly, I think it's like really complicated because um, I was just saying to some people last night, we got on this conversation and uh, uh, John Michelle came up, Basquiat. And I was saying, like, I feel a sort of way about him. Like recently, I'm feeling like, uh, you know, like uh, Elvis Presley had a twin that died in birth or something. You know what I mean? Uh, Jesse, I think, or something like that. And uh, and like with me and John Michelle, the thing is, we was like almost exactly the same age. Like like I think my birthday is November thirtieth, nineteen sixty, and I think he's like December fourth or fifth. So literally, like within a week of with you know of each other. So and I say that you know nobody in my mind like John Michelle is like a once in a gen you know in the century kind of artist. But but I remember the first times that I saw his work how I felt like I just got it a lot. And a lot, I think a lot of that was generational. But the fact of the matter was like, it was kind of just him. I mean, not in terms of, you know, obviously there are all these incredible artists now. We've seen this trend in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, like a Jack Whitten, you know, an artist who's absolutely operating at the highest level, but really didn't have any real success until very, very, very late in his life. Um, so there were all these artists around, um, you know, all the time. There were always people working at a very, very high level. But in terms of actually having any sort of, you know, mainstream traction or blue, blue chip status or something like that, they kind of just didn't exist. So, you know, you have like a John Michelle and like, I'm thinking like, that's the 80s. Like, that's really not that long ago. I mean, you know, it's really not that long ago. And then after he died, like essentially, in my mind, the two, well, the only two black artists, which it sounds crazy to even say this, there were just two black artists. That would be like David Hammonds and Lorna Simpson, you know? And um, without, you know, like I had a conversation, I can't really, I don't even know if I can really talk about it to a certain degree, but, but the, I guess what I'm trying to get at is this whole idea that when you say, like we were gonna have a blackout show and then we're on black and then we and we say like is that even possible? You know, like is it legal? Like there are certain, 
rules and regulations. People have forgotten that I did that, and like we just announced, like, hey guys, like doing more blackouts than people. I went to some blog, and they're like, how dare he do this? He's doing this for press. He's trying to say, do something like racist, like, but like opposite. And I was like, wait, first of all, we already did it twice. Like no one gave a fuck. And also, what? Like, are you crazy? Like, do you know how many times? Like, go to the Lehman trilogy right now. I dare you. Tell me how many black people you see there. You'll see two. That's a whiteout. Tell me it's not. You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. There ain't nobody black trying to see the Lehman trilogy. I'm exactly. sorry. Like, exactly. No, no, no. It's true. But, you know, it's really interesting, though, if you think about it. It's like, I remember, like, uh, in the late 80s, I was at this conference here in New York. And uh, I, I said something like, oh, yeah, friends of mine are starting to say things like we're the victims of integration. And there was, like, literally, like, a gasp went out over the audience, you know, uh, like older, you know, black artists, I guess, thinkers and stuff. They were like appalled by the very idea of it. But I guess we were kind of like young enough. We were old enough to have got the tail end of, you know, the black universe, like segregation and stuff like that. Uh, but what we're old enough or, you know, we had been born late enough that we actually start to actually exist in this world where certain things seem seem like possible, like, I can remember things, I know this sounds really crazy, but like Michael Jackson, the Jackson Five, like having a Saturday morning cartoon. Like, you know, there was a moment where it was like no black people on TV at all. And then within a year or two, you had the Jackson Five having a cartoon. Or I was just saying to somebody the other day, I remember, you know, we were talking about race and I was saying like, I can't remember my parents ever saying the word race to me. I don't remember if they, when they said it, you know, or if they say you're black. But I do remember talking to my dad and asking him if Yogi Bear was black or white, right? Yeah. So, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, it's very interesting to me how like an act like the blackout in a sense is re-instituting or re-instantiating a sort of, sort of situation that we all fought to get out of basically, which means a, a contained black kind of context. And, uh, and it's interesting to me because I do feel like increasingly I've, I've had this come up where I feel like I tell people, I think like there's a real fear of what I would call right, like radical difference, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's like, it's kind of understandable because on one hand, people know the uses to which difference is put, you know, like we say, oh, this person is attracted to that person. That's not appropriate. And via V, this is going to happen to them. Or this person uh, wants to live in this particular kind of way, so X, Y, and Z is going to happen to them. So we get into this whole thing where this, you know, people will often collapse uh, equal and the same. Like they'll say, we're all the same. And then they'll say, we're all equal. And they do this weird blurring of the thing, whereas in reality, um, yeah, we all should be equal, right? But we're not all the same. You know what I mean? And I wonder about this whole thing of leveling difference. Because to me, even if you say you're going to have a space that's only black people, it's fearful. Because on one hand, you're saying we are different, which is scary, because we know they're going to say, yes, they are different. See, by their own by their admission, they're different. Yes. So they should be treated different. But at the same time, you know, to, to run away from that, and this is like, I, I don't know what this effect is called. It's like, I know certain black people who basically won't eat fried chicken yeah. or won't eat water. There was a New York Times article today about this. Did you read it? No. It was, really, it was like, it's going viral. Um, also, I get tagged in anything about interraciality, so like, I know them all. Um, but there was a story today about a black woman, or it's about black people in general who like, um, code switch in front of white partners. Um, and so this black woman's like, I, I wore my Birkenstocks on this date with this white man that I'm dating now because like, and I would never do that with a non-black or with a, I would never do that with a black person, like wear Birkenstocks on a first date, but I wanted him to know I was fine. And she's like, and I talked different. And like, he never saw my natural hair. And it was like, whoa, that's crazy that, yeah. But anyway, keep going. No, 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 no. Whole no article I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm curious to know, like, like, cause you were going, you know, you obviously are a student. You're not just a practitioner in theater. You're clearly like a student of theater. You know what I mean? Cause you kind of have to be to survive in these spaces. Like me, like my own, you know, my own particular trajectory is like, you know, studied architecture, wanted to be an architect, realized very early that I wasn't going to succeed in that. Like I couldn't quite figure out. I couldn't see in my head how I was going to get to the target. You know, the target being like the same kinds of things I'm interested in now. It's like, 
you know, like I would say now, like, you know, like if I talk about cinema, I say like, how do you make a black cinema? Like, what does it look like? Or if, and I would have said at the time, I would say like, if kind of blue was a house, what would that look like? But the reality is most black people I knew didn't own their own houses, much less were in a position to sort of subsidize, you know what I mean? Uh, a, an experiment, like when you say you want to do experimental theater, to subsidize experiments around their house. You know, even like, you know, like I guess the most successful black architect, most people say maybe like Paul Williams and stuff, you know? And, you know, like 99% of his clients were white, you know? And a big part of the myth of Paul Williams were all the things that he had to do to actually survive in the context. Like, he learned how to, say, example, draw and write upside down, right? Because most of his clients wouldn't sit next to him. You know, as a black man, they wouldn't actually sit next to him. So if he was actually trying to show them what they had an idea, he'd have to put the drawing in front of them and draw upside down, which became a bit of a politic on one level, but it was essential for him to survive. So these are questions of difference and specificity. You know, on one hand, they are, and I've sort of said this before in many ways, but they're the thing that sort of you know, our, our, since our misery, like our common misery is bound up with it, but at the same time, it's the thing that gives our community shape. Right. It gives us contours and stuff. So I guess what, one of the things I'm really interested in, you know, with any black artist, particularly black artists who have got some traction or had some success or something like that, is how you negotiate or do you think about when you're making work, who you're speaking to, like who you're addressing, I would say. I th I think that like I never thought I genuinely never thought about that in the manner that I'm thinking about it now when I was making my work because I always was thinking about like what do I want to see that I've never seen because I'm always like I'm a Gemini so there's like two happening inside of me and like I'm always trying to get myself off because it's like there's so many things that I go to that like give me um uh like literally nothing like literally the amount of movies that are up for Oscars right now that I've had to go see and I've been invited to and I've been like why are people saying this is good like this gives me absolutely nothing right. it's like um and I'm such a student of every every part of culture that I like you know like I'm a student of art I'm a student of dance I'm a student of theater I'm a student of film so I'm just like sorry like Catherine Brie did it better like you know like why are we doing this and pretending like it's new like mm -hmm. Um, and so like when something does really gag me, I'm like, oh, that's what I want to get towards. I want to get towards like gagging myself again <laughs> and like, and feel like be gagged around me. Right? right. But like, there's no specific person I'm trying to gag more than myself. Right. Um, and every now and then there's like me and my mom or me and this friend. Right. So like with daddy, my play, um, that was my mom had never liked any of my plays. So I was like, uh, cause mom was like, oh, that's cute. Like I'd write my play, uh, write my mom a play for Christmas every year before I could afford um, anything. And so I'd like write these little plays and give them to my mom. And she's like, oh, this is so sweet. I'm gonna read this later. And she never did. Um, <laughs> And I was like, oh, because she'd read, like, the first page and be like, yuck. And I was like, oh. So I know that she won't like a play if it's, like, inspired by, like, Susan Laurie Parks too much, right? Or, like, or to Adrian Kennedy or to, like, even to Tennessee Williams, right? But what my mom wants is, like, a melodrama where she's the star, right? You know what I mean? We're like, I'm the star and she's the star. So, like, I like actively worked on a play for me that I was like, how would I make a play for my mom that I would like, right? right? So it's like, it's about a black gay boy who's like in an interracial, intergenerational relationship with like a white art dealer. And he's like a 25 year old black artist making contemporary sculpture. And like that, I knew that would excite me because like everything, cause like I was entering, I was about to apply to Yale. I was like going to McDowell, you know, like I was in all these like white daddy spaces. Right. Um, and like navigating how much of my soul I would have left. And they were just being like generally nice, but I was like, this is psychotic. Like, what do you want from me? And like, and I wanted to like, um, deal because again like what does it mean to have like a sort of like benign or passive um malice and 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 and, and not even be aware that you have that right but just your presence is that like you know just the building itself is like um so I wrote that and then I was like but in about 45 pages into it my mom has to come with the bible right and so then she did and it was great and so I think I think like that when I think about a play and I think that now post success I'm starting to think about ways like, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking always ways to protect that impulse, right? Because I think I've made my best work that way. But I'm also recognizing the fact that now I have fans and now I have other people who feel um, like um, my work both like 
shapes the kind of work that other black people will get to do and shapes the type of uh, response people will have to their work. So I'm very aware of those things. So I try to create spaces around it that are sort of subalterns of this capitalism that like will be like, oh, you see AJ's things? Well, okay, so everyone's buying AJ's stuff. So we need more black people making funky videos, like videos of all the things. Like if we get more of that, then like they'll buy it. The, the people who have money will buy it because it'll look like AJ's thing. And I ended up with me, people will be like, what's some more like hardcore, like crazy, funky black stuff that has sex in it? And, and I don't want people to think that's all I want. So like I created like the Golden Collection so that people can see all the kind of plays that I like and like create like these salons and all these. So... I think that when I think about how I, uh, who I write for, I'm now thinking as I'm in the act of making still just me and the couple people I want to give this play as a gift to. And then outside of that, once it's in production and I'm in charge of the theater of it all, like the, not just the theater that's on stage, but the theater around the theater, I'm constantly trying to construct spaces to be really responsible in ways that a lot of my idols weren't in like, um, inviting new voices radically into the space. Right. Cause I, I love difference and I think difference right. is important, but I think that especially as a black artist and I'm very interested in what you feel about this. I feel like as a black artist, I constantly feel that the, it's and it's historic. So I'm not saying anything new. It's like literally Harlem Renaissance, 1920s, like, um, like other black people police that difference even more because they're like, don't be too different. Cause it, it, it can, it can make you get killed. If they like it too much, you're probably doing something you shouldn't be doing. And I think that like, I I felt really guilty about that difference for a while. And now I'm just like, you know what, y'all, like I've, I've read everything that happened with the people who made the fire publication. I know y'all didn't want niggas being gay or anything in 1920. It's like literally like I'm reading tweets and articles and I'm like, this is literally like a repetition of something yeah. shitty that like, you know, uh, Leroy Jones wrote or Amir Baraka wrote about like James Baldwin in 1974. How do you, how do you feel that now? Because I've, I know very deeply um, sort of what my issues are in the fact that I work in an embodying medium, right? A medium that makes it difficult for people to separate fact from fiction, like the fact that people are doing a play. But in in what you do in art, like there's so much uh, conception and the conceptual, like so many conceptual frameworks to to explore and like words like black get put on you, even if you don't necessarily have to say them. So how do you feel the black uh, art community responds to like radical difference or explorations in that way? Does it feel like similar to when people write novels or movies or TV shows uh, or even music? Because I feel like you guys are the safest to me. Music, mu like music is different. Like music is just in advance, you know, of everything just because it's a space in which black people have operated the most freely. Uh, with the most, most complexity, diversity, and all these other kinds of things. And so often, when I talk about what I aspire to, I always would go to music. And some, sometimes I think people think I go to music because music is so great, which it is, right? But uh, a big part of why I go to music is because Black people have heard everything we've ever done. You know, it's incredible. Like, I'm terrible with lyrics. Like, I can't, I can't remember a lyric to save my life. But I can remember like little subtle inflections of when a person is singing. You know what I mean? A song I married 30 years ago would have come on and I can hum every little in, like intonational dip and dive. And I think most black folks are like that, right? So to me, the thing about music, if you're interested in discourse and ideas, music is the best place to go because if I make, so uh, for example, if I'm trying to create, uh, make an example or try to do something, you know, black people just know everything. Like we've heard everything. We know immediately the context in which if you say X, Y, and Z, it exists, right? Um, but but like for me, like increasingly, like the thing is, it's really interesting to hear you talk about making work for yourself primarily, you know, because from the beginning, I feel like, and I say the beginning, like I've had so many beginnings, like I've had, a, you know. You consider the beginning, because in my mind. That's what I mean, I'm saying, like it depends. Like I would have people come up to me saying, it's like, I've always loved your work. And I'm like, well, since when? You know what I mean? Like up until when? Like, because a lot of people, I exist, I didn't exist before, like love is a message. You know what I mean? Or for some people, I still get people calling me, man, trying to get me to shoot their films and stuff, you know, student films. And I'm just like, 
hey, I appreciate it. I'm just, I'm too busy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like basically for, you know, people have called me about things that I would have died to do, like, you know what I mean? Like 10, even 10 years ago, I was desperate to do, but now I'm just like too busy to do them. But, but the thing is, I guess more than anything is like, as of love is a message, I feel like there was a sort of impulse to construct it in a certain kind of way. Um, I don't know if I, if I want to say it was primarily from black folks, but I do feel like there was a la- way in which uh, people wanted to construct it as a sort of socio-political thing, which it is for sure. It's not like it's not not that, but I I don't like the idea that it gets contained as being solely that, you know, like like that's like primarily what it is. What because I know my motivations for doing it weren't like protesting anything. Like I wasn't trying to protest anything. And and so from the beginning, I would say things like, um, you know, I don't do uplift. Like I, I've said, and it's almost like people don't hear it. It's like they really, they've determined in their head because they know you love black people. Because I think I'm like really big. That's the horse I rode in on. I love black people. I love what black people do. But I don't do uplift. Like, and for most people, they don't understand how those two things cannot intersect. It's like, if you love black people, you must be organized and you're doing uplift and this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm a libertine. I keep saying I'm a libertine and it's like people don't hear it or something. You know what I mean? So, like, I think the first time I talked about love as a message in public was uh, up at Gavin's Harlem space. And I had a laser pointer that Hans York, Hans um, uh, York uh, Oberst had given me in London for a talk. So I had this laser pointer. So I go through the film, and I'm just shot by shot talking about why I think I put that shot there. And I could tell there were moments where people were like holding their breath because I would say, "Oh, when Walter Scott is running and he gets shot and killed, this is why this shot is very beautiful." And like people were really disturbed by that. But it was kind of like they. They mask, it's almost like it's noise, like it doesn't fit their preconception. So they filter that part out. So what I found for myself is that, you know, I make a thing for myself first and foremost under the assumption that there are other people like me. Like I like, I think like I'm a witch, you know, for example. Like I got this whole big thing about being witches, you know, and how like if, let's say, if one in a million is a witch in the community at large, right, in humanity at large, and then you say, okay, so now you got this isolated population of black people, right? And so that means maybe if you have a million black people and there's one in a million, and then given all the things that happen to you because it's an anti-black environment, you know what I'm saying? The odds start getting slimmer and slimmer and slimmer that you're going to meet another black witch, right? So if you grow up in a small town, you grow up thinking like you're weird, right? But you don't realize as soon as you achieve whatever velocity you need to escape the gravity well that you're born into, right? That as you go into the larger world, like even that one in a million becomes 100,000 or something like that in the larger community. So when you get out, you start to get with this whole idea that I can speak to my own specific weirdness and there's an audience for it. And not only that, but when you create works that feed an appetite for a certain kind of weirdness, for lack of a better thing to call it, it creates more of that audience too, particularly if you succeed. Because when you start succeeding, then people start you know, replicating or trying to uh, emulate what it is you're doing to succeed. So for me, increasingly, like say if I do something and I feel like it's successful, then I get very, very worried about one, the nature of the success. Like you said, it's a conundrum. You can't get around it in an anti-black environment where black people are a minority and you can't say who is gonna basically buy your thing, you know what I mean? You you get very, very quickly worried if you succeed because does this mean that my shit is fucked up? Or anti, you know, anti-black? Does that mean it's actually speaking to white people's desire for X, Y, and Z, even if you're unconsciously doing it, right? So I'm always kind of very much at odds with quote unquote, success, your, your thing succeeded. And then like, I very quickly want to go against that. You know, I'm like, I was like, I don't even want to live in a house I built myself or a castle I built. I'm very afraid to get trapped in it. So like my trajectory would be love is a message, which exists 
in the context of everything I did before, which some of art stuff even, which the art world was not interested in. And then I come back and the first thing I did was like a kingdom come at that on one level because I was like, it's not short. I'm not going to do anything short. I'm going to do something long. And I'm not going to do anything with not just long in terms of the overall duration of the piece, but it's not going to have short cuts. Like, there's not going to be a single cut in it that's less than, like, 10 seconds long. And many of them are, like, four or five minutes long, like one shot. You know what I mean? And I'm going to do something that's going to be a church thing. Like, I remember when I first, my uh, good friend of mine is Isis Pickens, who, uh, whose uh, husband was, like, a pastor of a church in LA and she was the first lady. I mean, a very sort of atypical first lady, but a first lady, you know, in the church. And so we talk about, you know, spiritual slash religious things a lot. She's that she's that friend for me. Um, so I showed her a kingdom come at that. She was the first person who saw it. I'm sorry, I think I hear Your my phone, phone playing music. No, I love that. Oh, I, I like the music. I thought it was just like sort of like some um, like, far off thing that like, because I have obsessive compulsive disorder. So like, yeah. sometimes I just hear a song in the background. Let's do it. <laughs> That's just happening. Whatever. I don't know yeah. the song, but I'm cool. Gonna, I'm going to fix it in a second. But um, so I showed it to uh, Isis and she laughed. She said, man, this thing is really something. She said, if I didn't know any better, I would think you were a believer. And we both chuckled you know, because she said, but I know you're not a believer. She knows I'm a heathen, right? You know, but what I said, like straight up is like I say, yeah, I'm not a believer, but I believe in black people believing. You know, our ability to believe things into being, to believe uh, transformation, these kinds of things. And so, like, I know my whole thing is very much that. It's like, love is the message. Okay, now I'm going to do something that's not that. And then when, in a sense, that didn't quite register, because I didn't think people kind of got how it was kind of going against the grain of love is message. I did the White Album, you know what I mean? And now I've done this new thing, just because I got so sick of people saying found footage, archival, all this. So I was like, okay, on a certain level, I made it large because I just wanted to make something with no found footage in it. So it's all CGI, you know what I mean? So it's like, Does no. it still have the music on it that you made as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah Which is yeah. also so cool to me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Like, I think, because one of the things you had said when I was in your studio, you're like, yeah, I just like started learning how to make certain music and like, I've always loved music. I've always been around musicians. But like, now I'm just doing that. And I feel like, Oftentimes, when I imagine what kind of career I want to have or when people ask me that question, I think of you because, like, you know, for me, so much of your start is, like, you know, uh, Daughters of the Dust and, like, being this amazing DP that, like, should have, you know, won the Cinematography Award at Sundance and then become, like, Steven Spielberg's DP and, like, for some reason that wasn't your trajectory. Um, and I'm constantly, when I thought about, you know, in the days after the time, like frustrations that I had not because I thought I was gonna win because I literally did and I was like I've been telling people forever I was like it's so cool that I got nominated for so many but like different people nominate then vote so like I'm not betting on anything because I didn't yeah, make yeah. friends with those people <laughs> you know what I mean um but I I did have sadness right because my friends were sad and upset and I got all the, I'm angry text and I was like okay um and but I was just like but you know what I'd rather have a career where people don't give me the 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 golden lion or the golden bear, the Venice Biennale until I'm like, you know, much older and have experienced life in a litany of ways, had children, et cetera. Then like to get it at 32 and be like, well, see, told you why people love you. You know what I mean? Like that would have been like the death. If I had won all 10 Tonys I could have won uh, for the play, it would have been like, yeah, see, we told you, they love, love you. Like they don't just like kind of like you and are kind of scared of you. Like they really love you and you're perfect. Um, so I wonder like, you know, when, when I when I, when I, when you do the things that you're doing now, like where you decide to say fuck to you to found footage and start making music and start, you know, challenging yourself, playing with yourself in ways no one else does, that's what I want to point towards. It's like, you know, I want to direct a film soon. I want to like make an album as well. Like I want to do like things that might get me in trouble. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm a big collector of quotations and stuff. You know, these these days, but like one of my favorites is. Uh, I was looking at this interview with Kanye, you know, and just went to Sunday service. It's a, it's an infamous one where he was talking to Sway, and this is when he was really on his fashion thing, and he was like pushing. He seemed kind of disinterested in music at the point, you know. And Sway was like, "Well, why don't you just do music or something, man? That's what you're good at, like this." He's like, "You're a real musician. You're not a real fashion designer." And he just got he just said, "But I'm not a real musician either." 
You know what I mean? Like I didn't go to music. I didn't go to music school. I can't read music or anything like that. And it's, it's it's and that's the part of it that's fascinating. This whole idea of operating in the space of a kind of permanent illegitimacy or something. And the illegitimacy has little or nothing to do with whether you studied or you trained. It has something to do with how other people anoint you as being legitimate or not. Like, how do you continue to operate in this space where you're self-affirming? And that's, look, that's what, when I say it, I believe in black people believing. If black people have any superpower, that is the superpower, right? The ability to be able to self-affirm. When black people say black is beautiful, or as I remember as a kid, when it, I remember the transition from people saying something was bad, meaning it was good. Like, I can remember that. I can remember people saying, that shit is bad. And in my mind, I would go like, that shit is bad, meaning it's good. You know what I mean? In my head, you know what I mean? But it's something about that, that specific thing, I think, is like at the core of like the part of blackness that we want to make sustainable, that we want to figure out how to protect. Uh, like, you know, I started saying recently, you know, like <laughs> I was in an interview and I, somebody was doing this uh, artist thing with me after the show and, uh, and they were talking, they were talking about me talking about my work. And I was like, well, my friends have always told me that I'm terrible in terms of talking about the meaning of my work, which is true. I very seldom talk about the meaning of my work because I, I, fuck if I know, you know what I mean? But I'm very, very good in terms of talking about process and aesthetics and things like that. You know, as a matter of fact, and I'm starting to say this more increasingly, like my rap is elite. Wow. I have a very elite rap. I mean, we, the art, yes. you know, maybe it's very waffling here or there, maybe, but the rap, it's super elite. So I'm very... You're Sagittarius. I am a Sagittarius, right? So I'm very conscious of something about the tension between what it is I envision making and my ability to be able to talk about it in a certain kind of way. Uh, a little like a jag leg pe preacher, even. Like, I'm a, little, I'm a little suspicious of it, maybe. But, like, I'm really big. I know, like, if I'm making work that generates quips. Even if I never say them in public, then I feel like that's a good work. Like, it's like, you know, no masterpieces, just conversation pieces. You know, stuff like that. Or like I was saying to somebody the other day, they were asking me about a Ghidra and the sound. I would say, yeah, I want it to be like you went to a Slayer concert and Teddy Pendergrass was seen. You know what I mean? It's just... I mean, my thing is I, I, I have a similar thing where it's just like, I don't make worthy work, but I make like the coolest work. Like, that's what I always try to think about. Like, you know, I'm in this whole thing right now with this film I worked on with Genix Bravo, and I love it so much. But like, I'm looking at all the movies that like are getting the really loud Oscar attention. And I'm like, oh, these works like presented themselves as worthy. And Jay and I never had to do that because we were like, oh, no, our shit is fucking rigorous and cool. Like, period. Like, like you can't question our 85 like page screenplay so we don't have to put worthiness like sp glitter on it you know what I mean and the same with Slayplay I was like I'm never gonna tell you like it's worthy of anything I'm just gonna like do the fucking thing you know and it's that's th that's the place of exhilaration for me because I would rather have people think about my work live with my work exist with my work then have something be called a masterpiece and then forgotten right like think of how many masterpieces we've had to like go to the openings of in the last like decade that we don't remember right you know i feel like that's the biggest issue with like the way the place that criticality is right now like sort of like um like large form criticality is that there's uh, so much anointing happening that there's like very little rigor in like the space of like um dramatic criticism art criticism film criticism etc um and i don't know what to do with that because it also seems to be so polarizing either it's like like you know the eternals is a masterpiece or like the eternals is the worst marvel movie that's ever existed i'm like which one is it it can't be both i don't think and i doubt it's either you but know it what i mean it might be and then like you know like my thing again is like increasingly i'm interested in metrics mm -hmm. you know because they're they're arbitrary really but the whole idea is like, how do you create your own metrics and how do you align what you're doing with that? You know what I mean? So like when you were talking, you said the word exhilarating. See, okay, so to me, that's a really good word. 
I like the word like exhilarating. Like I want to actually go see things that see things that are exhilarating. I'm less interested in seeing things that are good, good or bad. Like increasingly, good or bad is not product. It's not a product. I'm telling everyone to go see House of Gucci. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing tomorrow, next week. I don't know when it comes out. Go see House of Gucci. I'm just, you know what I mean. It's two hours of Lady Gaga being exhilarating. I don't know necessarily if it's if what I don't know if the movie she's in is called House of Gucci, but it is. And I love that. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's genius. It's exhilarating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or oh, I love Cecil Taylor, a word that Cecil Taylor started Cecil. to use like later in his life, intensities. Mm. Like how do you make a work that has intensities? You know, not a specific intensity, but intensities. Yeah. Like, how do you do that? And I, and I constantly think about like the, the stuff that I'm attracted to. I had a conversation yesterday with a friend, an artist, and we were talking about, um, God, I wonder if I can even say the artist's name. Okay. Maybe I don't want to get in trouble. So say I'm it. Gonna, no, I'm not going to oh. say the artist's See, name. See, Gemini versus Sagittarius. It's like, <laughs> one's like, I'll get in trouble. And the other one's like, mm, I'll, I'll flirt it with it. But we were having this conversation. I was saying how much I like this other artist's work. And they were like saying, well, you know, some people I trust, saw that and they kind of didn't like it you know or they didn't they didn't they didn't think it was very good or they said well the dancers thought the dancing was mediocre even though they liked everything else about it and the painters thought the painting was mediocre even though they liked everything else about it and it was like this litany and they said so i started wondering if it's good it's just that people who know enough to know won't they don't know enough to say that's really mediocre dancing and i was like and they said like well, in a way, it seems like that artist is more a talent scout, or they are, it's something corporate about it, like their, their, their ability to be able to just pick things that are cool and put them in this context. And I was just like, well, that description, that sounds like Larry LeVan to me, like what you just described. So I refuse the whole idea that that's corporate. I mean, corporate folks might do that too, I don't know, but I refuse that idea. And I, it really felt like in the moment, I was like, I don't know if this is a generational schism because, I mean, I'm the same age as that artist, but for what, I mean, the artist who was offering, it wasn't really a critique, it was more like observation. But I was like, yeah, but I don't know. That's something really important about that. That's, a, that's an important other kind of gesture of how you make work. It's not always, you know, these romantic ideas we have about what real creativity looks like. I'm thinking about this because I think about this generational thing a lot because I think that there's like a real and it, again it's very interesting because I think Gen Z has taken on some of what Gen X had in a sense which is like this real like um, sense that there's like corporate uh, overlords that like are, have great like you know foresight or like ability to like do things so this idea of like the an industry plant is constantly around and it feels like the sort of like um sort of like a rehash of the sellout from like gen, gen x and i was thinking that like some of the relationships to labor and like how one engages with labor are very gen z gen x like repetitions anyway one of the things i find really crazy is this like um sense that like corporate uh corporate can be aligned with this um with an idea of ta scouting talent with any um uh detail or uh expertise right because i actually feel like corporate like entities tend to be really bad at like finding interesting things right like it's like the they they're they're good at absorbing um the talented but the 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 actually talented that corpor corporations absorb end up exhibiting that talent to a, in a large scale before they're absorbed by corporations right? Right, right which i find like sort of like but I, again i think there's just like um this uh performative sort of like anti-establishment thing that happens with a lot of people in the generation of like gen x and i think now gen z that i find really kind of curious and exhilarating because also I like the, i don't know the difference between gen x and gen z it's I, like I it's like, like 40 years that's all the difference but okay. um and, like, and again and like there's some there's some like uh and again this is not me saying millennials are cool because they literally aren't um but like um and I actually learn a lot more from gen z but i just find that that some of these rehashing discourses to be very interesting i've been thinking a lot about industry plants because i've been called one and i'm like wait you, what industry the what an industry plant plant 
Like yeah, like some like some basically like some some corporate overlords like sort of like created me in a lab and like f- uh, put me at Yale School of Drama because again I do understand that wh- like how like if you like don't know me and haven't been around me you would be like there's something sketchy about all this like I didn't finish undergrad I was in L A for seven years randomly doing what who knows and then I go get into Yale School of Drama and then graduate and have a play go to Broadway called Slave Play that's like you know it's just like it all like if you if you're looking for a conspiracy it's like I am a good person but like um I I I also am like but I literally wasn't like I don't know I tried to get it's like you're the most genius product of some co-entail pro thing that ever came up <laughs> yeah it's like it's like also little Nas X is accused of it too but I'm also just like I don't think I don't again guys I really wanted an industry to plant me somewhere for so long yeah, yeah. and no one touched me so like I don't know no, no absolutely I had a friend come up to me recently a friend actually said they were talking to a friend and it was like yeah age AJ is making it now. He never sold that. I was like, nobody was ever buying. You know? <laughs> like, Wait, hold on. What would your sellout project have been? Like, would you have done like, like what would have been? What have been like the? You've seen it. And you've been like, that was so successful. I could have shot it the exact same or better, and it would have been the sold out thing. Like, what would it? What would it be? You mean it's a cinematographer, yeah, or just not, or an artist? Anything? Like, what would? You, what do you imagine could have been your pathway to selling out that would have allowed you to have like a comfortable life for your thirties in a way that like is different or your twenties or whatever. I mean, to me, my whole, my life feels like I'm in some sort of video game or something now. Like, so, I mean, it's weird. Like even money, like I say now is monopoly money. And, and I don't mean that to discount the importance of money, but cause it's important, obviously. I mean, for the first time in my life, I don't worry about my rent, car note or anything like that. But you know, it's not the answer as people said, you know, said before, but like, there have been so many, like, you know, multiverses. Like, I'm happy to be the AJ in this universe that I am. Because there's a whole bunch of AJs who are sad, broken down people. You know what I mean? Um, because, you know, I had there were so many moments where I could have gone down a particular path. Like, my best friend always would say, man, you need to get the fuck out of here, man. You need to go to England or Germany or Berlin or somewhere. Like he was saying it 20, 30 years ago. Like I had people give me opportunities that I could have, like, I know some of these, you know, people say I'm like Forrest Gump almost. It's like, I, like I remember once Warren Carway asked me to shoot his next film, right? Which was In the Move for Love, which is his greatest film, right? <laughs> And um, I was like, I, I remember being at the New York, uh, I think it was at the New York Film Festival, Norman Wong, who represented him, had shown him Daughters of the Dust. And I remember him uh, holding my muscle and said, you have very strong muscles, so you can do a lot of good handheld shots. And I was like, <laughs> kind of crazy. But, uh, or John Wu, for example, asked me to shoot his first film when he first came from uh, whatever, you know, came from uh, Hong Kong to here. And uh, I was afraid to do it. Like, I was kind of, like, nervous. Like, my dad, who never uses profanity, is the one time I ever remember him using profanity in front of me. Because I was like, Dad, I, I don't really know. I don't know if I'm ready to shoot. It was a, uh, a John Claude Van Damme action film. And I was like, so I was going to be jumping from daughters to that, right? And I was like, I really don't know if I'm ready for this. I'm a little nervous. And my dad says, son. If people think you're ready to do something, they want to give you the opportunity to do it, do it and fuck it up. <laughs> you won't be off the any worse than you are. But I mean, I would, you know, it turned out that John Woo didn't even have enough uh, control and autonomy to hire me. He was very embarrassed that they asked me to do it. And then in the end, he was, um, you know, overruled. And they hired another fine cinematographer, but you know what I mean? But I, I often think of all these junctures where, I could have gone down certain paths. Oh, man, giving me the script, the white man can't jump. Like, when you say, like, if you go to, um, you know, at Sundance, like, when I won a cinematography award at Sundance, that was one script that ended up in my hand. And I remember just seeing the title of it, White Man Can't Jump. I was like, hell no, I'm not shooting no film club. <laughs> white Man Can't Jump. You know, like, my mentors will kill me. You know, they didn't, like, put me here to do that. And even, I tried so hard for so long, man, I can't tell you so stories. I can spend a whole night talking about horror stories about me trying to exist as a cinematographer. Tried so long to shoot 
you know, other people's films and stuff and really, really love cinematography as an art form, would have been super happy to do it for a larger part of my life. But I just never really got the people who would have been interested in me doing things, didn't have money to do things. And then the people whose work I, like, I would have loved, like, shot for Andre Tarkovsky or something like that. You know, that would have been incredible. But I just would never get offered things that were, like, interesting. So I would find myself constantly, I remember it got to the point where when people would interview me to shoot a job, I would just, like, not say anything. I would make myself just be monosyllabic. I would just say, and then I would go and say, I'm going to say yes to everything. They say, no matter how idiotic it is, they would say something, I would say, yes, that's possible. You know, yes, yes, that's possible. Yes, that's possible, like that. And even then, I couldn't, I remember once I went in pretty late to, uh, I got, you know, I was like sort of desperate for work, right? And I was like, I got to do something because I got my kids, I got to take care of my kids, all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, I went in for this job, a friend recommended me. I went in and uh, they interviewed me. I said, yes, yes, yes to everything. And then eventually I said, well, what's your vision of cinema? And I just looked around like, is this a setup or something? So, you know, so I did like a very, like for me, it was a very, anybody who knows me, it was a very tight 30 second, this is my vision of cinema. And then I was like, they said, okay, this is great. And then I went to talk to the money person and it was like $100 a day, you know, to do that job. And I was like, wow, I don't know if I can afford to do this job, right? I don't know if I can pay my bills with this job. And uh, I said, but I probably need to take it because if nothing else, if I work for three months, my chops will get up, all this kind of stuff. And I'm sitting at the bus stop in LA now, and this is, tells you where I was at. I'm sitting at the bus stop in LA contemplating whether or not I can afford to take a $100 a day job. And they call me while I'm sitting there and say, you know what? We've decided to go with someone who's less experienced than you. And I was... Crestfallen. I really was. I mean, it was like a kind of Latino Degrassi high type thing, you know? <laughs> and uh, and so, like, in a weird kind of way, when you say, well, what kinds of things would you have done? I just feel like my whole life has just been littered with, on one hand, opportunities to do certain kinds of things. I just never had a vision of myself as being a very interesting, weird black dude in Hong Kong shooting for Wong Kar Wai. I mean, I'm curious about that AJ who actually said, fuck, I'm going to buy this ticket. I'm, you know, like, it's a lot like that move is a lot like my fantasies of Jimi Hendrix going to London and getting a deal and starting the experience. I, I mean, I get that. One of the reasons I love techno in addition to the music itself is because in Germany, they revere techno artists. So Jeff Mills and you know, and people like that went over there and they were recognized as the geniuses that they were. So I had all of these fantasies about going elsewhere to get on, to get myself on. But for me, I always felt like there was something about just staying, as my friend Fred would say, in the hole. You know, just like, I was like, at a certain point, I was like, come hell or high water, this is it. Like, I'm kind of not built constitutionally, I'm not interested in going elsewhere. Like wherever I land, it's gonna be this. And for a long time, I just felt like, you know, like I just was saying to Gavin not that long ago, a few months ago, I was like, we were sitting up having dinner or something. I just casually said, oh, I'll always be a failure in my mind, you know? And he just looked at me and said, what are you talking about? And I was like, at my age, unless I live to, if I continue to be successful, and maybe if I live to be 130, maybe, like I could have more life as a success than as a failure. But most of my life has kind of be, you know, has been not a success. I mean, it's weird. Like if you meet people, like you 20, you start out, everybody has a vision of what they want to do. The pragmatic people by 25, they go for something that seems realizable. But most people can hang on to their about 30, let's say. And most people, when they hit 30, they seriously start looking around if they're not getting traction in terms of what they can do. Because then 30 to 40 is that critical juncture. Some people go past 30. Once you start to get to 40, it's no looking back. You can't, you kind of can't, you can't, it's not, it's too late for you to, you know, do the right steps and get there, whatever, you, however much money you need to retire, whatever the fuck that's supposed to be about. But, um, <laughs> And so, and then to be 40 and then at 50 and to be a not a success, which is de facto a failure, is a very frightening thing.
I have young people all the time come to me and say, how did you do it? I have older people come to me and ask me, how did you do it? And I'm like, there's no map. I can't give you a map. And if I could, this is not the road you want to travel. This fucking shit is like hair raising. You know what I mean? Like, my hair is fucking gray. I mean, because of this, it's not the way you want to do it, you know? I'm constantly exist in this tension between what I'm in a position to do now, what I aspire to do now, and the fact that it's an idea I had 30 years ago. It's like a Rip Van Winkle effect. I, I, I even told Gavin, a part of the tension in my work is the gravitas of a person who's been thinking about work for 30 or 40 years, but like a newbie who doesn't quite know how to make it. So it's kind of got a kind of sort of punk rocky energy, but with this other kind of thing going on. I mean, I know that's part of the character of my best work. I don't know if I'm ever going to get to this point where I'm going to sync up with, you know, the quality of my thinking about what I'm going to do. It's going to sync up with what I have the technical skills or the patient or the ability to do. And I've just accepted it, you know what I mean? But it's not something that can kind of be, I don't think, can be replicated or should be replicated. There's a, <laughs> and I did this interview, you know Faith, do you know Faith High School? Yes, well, no, you told me about this interview. Oh, I love yeah, this I interview, know. yes. I don't know them personally, but I think they don't like me too. They don't like everybody. <laughs> I think like there everybody. might be some people they like. I just think I'm one of them that they don't like. Yeah, they don't like everybody. But in any event, when I was talking to Faith, like, they were doing this sort of crazy analysis of me, and they kept going on the thing like, you know, they have different pet peeves. They're going to, like, one of the things is, like, non-degreed artists. Like, going in on a like, non-degreed artist. And I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, and I never even corrected them. I'm like, I'm a non-degreed artist. What are you talking about? I didn't go to, you know, I didn't go to whatever the school, the arts. I've never been to an art school, anything like that. So it's just very, I don't know, I got on this very personal jag now. But it's very interesting being out here as a black person who's succeeding in succeeding foregrounding blackness, but support who has a certain kind of, who has a support from non-black people. It's the most complicated thing to negotiate. I mean, I feel like there could be a secret, like you said, a blackout conference of people just having that conversation. Well, the thing you said earlier, I, I thought about this, and I was like, oh, wow, that is kind of what I, I, I think I did think of it like that. You you said something about like how like um uh most black people don't own their own houses or something like that. And I definitely didn't see the Broadway theater as a house I owned. Um, but I saw myself as a guest that didn't need to be, um, uh, uh, I, but it, it felt like a house I should own, and it didn't, and it also felt like I was a guest that um, didn't feel the need to be deferential to the house I was in. So I felt very much like that night was like my Rick James night, like you're like fuck your couch night, you know what I mean? And like that's how I treated it. And I and I and I think that something that's interesting about your punk rock punk rockness is that like you have like Papa punk rock where you're like I don't need to be here, I can go home. And people are like no, don't go, don't go, you're here, you're here, and you're like mm, I think I can go home. And like that makes you even sexier and funner and cooler. And and I think that there's uh, something to that um, that as a modus operandi of being a young black artist or a black artist in general inside of these spaces and with the support from non-black people is that like just because one has the support does not mean and it, A, it doesn't mean you have to be like ungrateful, right? Like of like the work you've done to be here, the the what that support can cost a collaborator at times, right? You know, I definitely have people who are like fought for me for many, many years who are not black, who just fought because they like saw my passion, love the work, and were like, I'm gonna do it. So I'm not sitting around being like, fuck you too, non black person. <laughs> but like, I also don't have to be like, oh my God, thank you so much, Mass. Like, you did. This. It's like, no, no, it's like, there's it's, there's a fine line, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that. Part, not so fine. Yeah. You know? yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I think that like, uh, or I mean, yeah, it's not a fine line at all. But I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, well, I mean, I think the fine line is between love and hate, right? You know, it's like, it's like, I hate the fact that there aren't more like uh, people that look like me who have the same power to like make those decisions. Yeah, yeah. And so that I constantly do have to be inside of situations with people who like, even with their love and their support, they still are like sitting in an EDI conversation with me. They're like, wait a second. Wait, white supremacy is also in love too? And it's like, yeah. yeah, babe, it is. I also thought the play you've been supporting for years told you that. Um, anyway, moving on. You know what I mean? It's like, like that's one of those complicated things about that sort of entanglement and that integration. Like, having people that 
I've worked with literally for five years say things like the racial reckoning and like have like George Floyd completely changed their or like publicly changed the way they see things. And I'm like, wait, but like, why have you been working with me for so long then? Like, you know, like, yeah, like yeah. what do you think I was saying? Um, but yeah, I, I think that part of it is um, living with the autonomy that like you can say fuck your couch anytime you're inside of these spaces of support. And uh, yeah, I don't know. And, and maybe like, uh imagine uh and start building subalterns that can become their own sort of spaces that are radically different and maybe like outside of the realm of capitalism that like support and reimagine ways to support black people in their work i mean that's what i'm trying to do now like you know like the the 10 year plan is like my weird commune in virginia for like theater um that looks like romeo castellucci but like less uh italian <laughs> um yeah well you know i don't know about the escaping capitalism sort of thing so much but i i, I kind of feel like for me i mean i try to think about things deeply but at the same time i always just try to act like on a personal level like i feel like when we made daughters, I remember like very distinctly, and this is like, I'm like, what, 26 or something like that, when we first went down. And uh, so I didn't know, what the fuck did I know? You know what I mean? But I did know enough to say to people around me, like, hey, and maybe this, I knew this because my dad had said some version of this to me at different points in my life. Because my dad would always say, black people do not get paid to sit, sit on the bench. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you're getting paid, you people expect you to deliver. And being there, it's dependent on you delivering. But I remember going down with Julie Dash, who was the director and producer, and with Gary James Dash. Marshall, you know what I mean? Who's our production designer. And I remember asking people to work with us, and I would always say to them, come see what we're gonna do. We don't know, we might fall on our faces, but, but it's not gonna endanger you, you know what I mean? Like you can actually have the opportunity to watch us do what we're doing at close range and not be at risk yourself, which black people don't often get a chance, you know, to experience. We don't get to see being in the recording studio with so-and-so just because, I mean, in hip hop, in music, maybe in jazz, that's one of the few spaces, and maybe basketball, where you see that, where people can kind of be around and not have to be driving the recording session or something like that. But in mostly every other spaces, we don't really get a chance to watch the thing happen, to see how it's put together. We either had just come in and put it together ourselves or be it, you know, fucking out on our asses. And so for me, I'm always very conscious of like, okay, you can think about these things and you can think about these opportunities. And I'm very much you know, a child of the South, I'm very much a black man of the South who was born at a certain time, who still understands that, um, you know, we have no privilege. Like there's no, like, you know, my son has a sense of privilege about so many things, but me, I have no sense of privilege. I don't feel like I deserve anything. I don't feel like anybody owes me anything. It's very, very different. So when I have an opportunity to do something, I always go in like this, like I said, with daughters, it's like, shit, we might fall on our faces, but you can see what this shit looks like, right? Uh, you might come out of just saying, whatever I do, I'm not gonna do what they did, right? Or like in my first show at the Serpentine, you know, so it's like Arthur Jaffer, but it's got miscellaneous Frida Arapabo and Ming Smith, you know? And so my, my thing was like, Shit, I don't know. This shit might be a fluke, man. I didn't understand why Hans already called me to do a show. This shit was crazy to me, right? But I was like, okay, it might be the worst show of all time. But but one thing I'm going to be able to say is I presented Ming Smith to the world as a genius that she is. Nobody can ever take that from me, right? Or I presented Frida Arapabo as the brilliant artist that she is. Nobody can ever take that from me. Miss, I'm still pushing miscellaneous. <laughs> that one is the one that hasn't gotten any traction yet, but I'm still pushing it. And so I really think this whole idea of like including people, like when you make your move and stuff, is a very basic kind of thing that we can kind of do when you say, and it's not out of mission, it's not missionary, it's not altruism. I don't feel like ego structures and that kind of stuff. I think they work totally different from us, like I've said a zillion times. When was the last time you heard a hip hop record that had one MC on it? Exactly, I think this about this all the time. It can exist. Uh, it yeah. can be, I'm the baddest motherfucker of all time. 
mic to 10 other people on their record, right? Yes. Like Wu-Tang Clan. Like, those motherfuckers don't have egos. Come on, the like, ego structure's totally different. They all have raging egos, and they still work together. It's like I mean, a you doing a show with Ming Smith is like Kanye putting Nicki Minaj on a on a track, right? It's like he's like, listen, I'm gonna let Nicki eat us all up, and like that's just totally. period, point totally. blank. It's gonna happen. I mean, it's also for me, you know, the 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 arrogant part of me is like. I'm that badass too that I can have Ming Smith. It's kind of that's how Kingdom Come and Bad's for me. It was like I'm gonna put this piece in my show that's got the baddest performers on the face of the earth singing about shit they really believe. Fuck singing the song and interpret it like when Leandra Johnson singing Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She's really feeling that shit, and I'm like, can I put this in my show and not have my, all of my shit that I made pale next to it? Right, so there's a part of challenging yourself. So part of it's like this is like, yeah, I'm not afraid. It's like Miles Davis wasn't afraid to have John Coltrane, the baddest motherfucker in the world, in his band. He cried when John Coltrane left his band. And it wasn't because he was uh, in awe, uh, you know what I mean? But it's just the ego structure culturally is just totally different. I mean, on some level, it has something to do with like a slave ship, being chained in a slave ship and like together. The togetherness of that and how that levels certain kinds of things. It does certain very peculiar things to your ego, I think. it does, Just like Hortense talks about the question of empathy and how empathy is bound up with, you know, the slave ship as an originary site for who we are psychically, you know? I was just saying to somebody the other day, just like, I'm, I'm thinking like quips things, right? Um, we were talking about a Ghidra again, <laughs> my piece, and I was saying, yeah, it's like seeing a James Terrell. You know how he'll just cut a hole in the ceiling, you see the sky? But imagine seeing that James Terrell and you're a slave in the bottom of a slave ship. Like if you chained in the bottom of a slave ship and they opened up the hole for a second and you saw the sky. Like, what is that? Like, what can we do with that? Like, I, I like to say, how do we mind the catastrophe? of this thing, like how, what do we do with it? Given it's all these horrific experiences that we've had, continue to have, and will have in the future, you know what I mean? And that like so much of the, like, like so, I mean like, that, this is so annoying because I'm like been so stuck inside of the slave trade because of this TV show I'm working on. Um, because if you're gonna talk about like the, you know, biracial, Cajun people in New Orleans, you had to start thinking about like the North Atlantic slave trade and like the, the in, in the Atlantic slave trade as well. Anyway, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot so much is like how so much of our processing about it is still so in our bodies because like so much of you know um what they call um uh, like seasoning slaves or like you know breaking them down took place around language right and this inability to express what you had just experienced right so they would like mix people up and do all this stuff and so like for so long we haven't had like a, a communal language for so long of like that experience you didn't have a communal language and like freedom in order to like talk about it and process it so i feel like we basically had 200 years or uh, 150 years to like process like 400 years of trauma. And so that means there's so much more to think about, so many more catastrophes to mine. Yeah, I, it's it's crazy. Also, the amount that like I when I went to New Orleans, if you've never been to New Orleans, please just go and like visit a lot of cool places because like it's literally like being in like a European country or like some wildly foreign country, like some upside down that's not. America and the histories you'll learn just going to all these museums that are all owned by black people some of them just like in someone's house are crazy like truly truly crazy like the amount of freed men that were in and around New Orleans from like 1600 free black men from 1600 to 1848 are it's like astronomical you're just like oh wait so they were just like fully black billionaires in the 1700s like why did no one tell me about this like oh there was like fully like a massacre of like freed black men who had went to and like they all were french speakers who had like studied in france and like went to the white house and talked to abraham lincoln i was like hey guys so like listen like i know women shouldn't vote because yuck but like we're black and we speak french like we should be allowed to vote right like we're smarter than most of our peers and the president was like mm, maybe um and then they went back to new orleans and all of these like black democrat or white democrats were like killed them and then they like literally massacred them and no one ever told me that history until like i went to new orleans and like i don't know it's crazy anyway so much catastrophe to mind I'm obsessed with you. With me? Yeah. Your brain, the way you the way you process things. <laughs> um, 
I think there is never going to be a good time to interrupt this conversation, ever. A huge round of applause to both of our visionaries this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for pushing for what you deserve, want, and need. We all appreciate it. Thanks to all of you who have come and joined us this evening. Enjoy the rest of your night here online and wherever you move forward to. Thanks.